Okay, good evening and welcome to the latest installment of the Building the Scottish State show with myself, uh, Dr. Mark McNaught here on the 16th of December, 2021. And I have the great pleasure this evening of having me uh, with me, Mrs. Uh, Yvonne Ridley, uh, journalist, uh, independence activist, and uh, a very interesting person that I hope to get to know better over the course of this particular interview. So first of all, Yvonne, thank you so much for being with us. Yeah, great to be here and thank you for the invite. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. So just give us a bio. I, I, I you know, I, I, you know, was asking my, my colleague, Kevin, no, who, 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 you know, who, who uh, do you know anybody that could be a, 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 a guest? And he suggested you and I contacted you and you accepted the invitation. But uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, just you know, kind of your career journey your, or, you know, your, your, your political journey and just mm -hmm. uh, who you are and why you support independence. Well, my friends will say that I'm a, a journalist with more than 40 years experience, um, politically aware and and active for decades, well, since a teenager. Mm -hmm. um, and my enemies will turn around and say, oh, her, that's the woman who fell off a donkey in Afghanistan and was uh, held by the Taliban. Okay. <laughs> so... Um, all of which is is true and uh the taliban experience happened 20 years ago and i'm still trying to uh do something or achieve something that uh that is no longer you know an important part of uh of who i am <laughs> Yeah. Well, can you tell us a little bit about the experience to the extent that you want to, of course? Uh, mm. uh, well, know, what, it, what it's, and, yeah. yeah, I was held for um, 11 days by a regime that I was told was the most brutal, evil regime in the world and a regime that hated women. So I guess, you know, I felt at the time I'm just not going to survive this experience. So I became the prisoner from hell and I shouted at them, I swore at them, uh, nothing too bad. And uh, I went on hunger strike and, you know, they um, when they released me, it was on humanitarian grounds. And I wonder, um, you know, whether that was for their benefit or mine. And mm -hmm. I really don't know who was happier to see the back of me. Uh -huh. uh, you know, them or, or when I crossed over into um, no man's land from Afghanistan and, and uh, was handed over to the Pakistan authorities. So it, um, it was, as I say, a, a, a bad experience, but I came back and people said, how were you treated? And I said, with courtesy and respect, and there was outrage because uh, the war had started we were dropping bombs on these so people when, so, so when you were captured that was before the beginning of the war is that is yes that, uh -huh. okay. i'd okay. um sneaked in um as a i was the chief reporter of the sunday express and i sneaked in uh with a couple of guides Mm -hmm. and wanted to do a report on what life was like under the Taliban. Um, I hadn't intended on getting captured. I'd been two well, days what, what in. Doesn't, and... One doesn't plan for that normally. <laughs> no, no. And, uh, you know, when I uh, came back, um, I wrote about the experience. I wrote a book about it, and it... Uh, a lot of people were very upset because, you know, I didn't say anything too negative about the Taliban. And, and it, so it didn't, it, didn't fit, it, it didn't fit the narrative that we're fed about how... No, because you, know, you can't drop bombs on nice people. So um, people well, were very angry. <laughs> well, it's typical wartime propaganda. It's not the, mm -hmm. not the first time that it's been that. I, but I, it's I, propaganda that has continued for more than 20 years. And, um, you know, it continues today. And, you know, we're seeing horrendous images coming out of Afghanistan with predictions that a million children will die of starvation and the, um, the big Christmas appeal by the BBC, of course, uh, the DEC uh, appeal is um, on 
Afghanistan, but not anywhere does it say these people are going to starve to death because America has frozen the banks and the assets and ruined the economy. And that is why Afghan people are going to die this Christmas. Yeah, and, I know. It's and... Same in Cuba, same in Iran. I mean, it's, you know, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the, 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 you know, America is the big, you know, kind of mafia don in the world. And any country that steps out of line and doesn't follow orders is going to be punished, you know, and it's the same, you know, and especially mm -hmm. after a humiliating, you know, withdrawal. Uh, as Well, as it was had. a defeat, wasn't it? It was a 20 year yeah. war, which ended in defeat, which saw the greatest uh, superpower uh, just defeated by yeah. a group of men in shalwa kameez and flip-flops mm -hmm. and, and and the ak-47s mm -hmm. well why what is your reading on the Af afghan war uh, you know and, and and the iraq war for that matter i mean mike I've, I've watched a lot of i've gotten really into watching noam chomsky videos and so i have you know my, my perspective has changed quite a bit from the days when I was, you know, lived in the United States and I wouldn't mm -hmm. call myself a hyper patriot, but, you know, you kind of get along or you go along with the home team, you root for the home team. So, of course, you're for the, you know, for the Americans against these terrible Iraqis or, and I remember the Iran crisis in 1979 and, you know, all of the vitriol that was, uh, you know, put towards, uh, put towards the Iranians and, and all that. But, you know, they never talked about, you know, the Shah, the Mossadegh uh, being overthrown in 1953, so et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, I mean, what what is your reading on on that on those wars, and why, you know, what do you think the purpose was of it uh, of of these of these wars? Um, I think the purpose of it was making a lot of uh, very powerful people, not necessarily in public positions either, but making a lot of very powerful people um, very very rich and even more powerful. Yeah, the military because wars. Yeah, yeah, you know, wars, Raytheon, uh, make money you know, general for, dynamics, Boeing, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. For arms dealers and, and you know, we're seeing it uh today that it, it's uh it really is um shameful. I mean the Iraq war was illegal and uh it is still hemorrhaging uh lives today. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I visited Iraq on several occasions before the war. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't a fan. What, like late, of, uh, late, late 90s kind of thing? Uh, yeah. You know, after, after, yeah. The first, after the first Gulf War? Right. Okay. Yes. And I wasn't a fan of Saddam. Um, you know, he, he was uh, a brutal dictator. And, uh, but the, the Iraqi people, were absolutely wonderful, yeah, educated, I know, I know. civilized. Yeah. You know, I think there was probably at that point more PhDs in Baghdad than anywhere else in the world. Yeah, and yeah. now the country is a basket case, uh, yeah. overrun with corrupt politicians. The educational institutions have collapsed. Uh, the status of women has collapsed. And it, it's just awful. And yeah, I know. Um, I, 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 mm. back back in the eighties, I lived in Austin, Texas, and I had a really good friend, uh, Hemi, who was Iranian, and uh, just the you know most distinguished, intelligent person you could possibly imagine. And I'm sure he was representative of so many Iranians, but it was so mm -hmm. different from the image that we're fed of these, you know, fanatical, you know, burn burn American flags, death to the great Satan kind of you know, mm -hmm. kind of fanaticism that is attributed, that was attributed to them and, and certainly the Iraqis as well. So, uh, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, any, anything else you want to, before we turn to more contemporary Scottish issues, is there anything else you'd like to, I mean, what was your main takeaway from your experience there in, in, in terms of your captivity and your, and your experience with the war? What, what would you say was the big, the big lesson that you learned from that or the thing you, that you, you found the most, um, you know, informative? Just don't believe anything you read in the newspapers <laughs> <laughs> and and especially people in power who will lie and uh you know we we know that now um after the various inquiries into the iraq war we know the lies about weapons of mass destruction and you know the lies keep tumbling out and it 
Uh, and, and now um, lying is almost a, a requirement in Downing Street. You yeah. know, you look at Westminster and, and my goodness, um, I suppose in some ways uh, Boris Johnson is, has been the biggest advocate for independence in Scotland because, you know, even died in the wool unionists are beginning to wake up and think, gosh, you know, we, we can't leave our destiny in the hands of the Eton mob um, yeah. who are, you know, bringing chaos uh, to uh, Westminster and, and, and the rest of the country. Yeah. OK. All right. Uh, so t tell us a little bit more about your kind of political journey. So you were uh, mm. a Labour supporter for a while, a SNP from the, now in the Alba party. What, what, just tell us a little bit. I mean, yeah. you know, even, bef even before you got interested in Scottish independence, what was your, uh -huh. you know, just tell us a little bit about your uh, your political upbringing. I was a, a socialist from being a, a teenager. You know, I became acutely aware um of class and the class system and the establishment. You know, my environment uh, were, was um, the shipyards, the steelworks, the coal mines. Where um, was that? Was that where, and that where was, was in the northeast of England. Right, the, the um, Durham kind of area. County Durham, um, yeah. coal fields, the Tyneside shipyards, and, and mm -hmm. concert uh, steelworks, which. Uh, you know, so many communities existed around these heavy industries. And I joined uh, the Labour Party as a teenager um, when, you know, it would be inconceivable for any Conservative MP ever to get elected. Uh, in in these areas, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and now and there's a great big blue wall where the mines once stood, where the the steelworks were. You know, there are Tory MPs, and and uh, I am I can understand why people have voted Tory and turned mm -hmm. their back on Labour. I can fully understand why, but I you know. Even if someone put a gun to my head, I can never see the day that I would put a cross down um, for a Tory candidate at, at any level. Yeah, yeah. And wh what is what does being socialist mean to you and being, you know, living in the UK? Uh, you know, obviously it's I mean, growing up in the United States, it was the worst insult you could lob at anybody. And I'm you know, and I, I'm beginning to understand why, because. In the United States, the left has always been crushed, you know, yes. and, uh, you know, with and with very limited exceptions during the 1930s under FDR and under this during the 60s with the uh, with the Great Society under Lyndon Johnson. There were, you know, progressive, you know, laws passed that, you know, actually kind of helped individual, you know, people, you know, in, in general. Mm -hmm. But by and large, I mean, you know, the Democratic Party has never been even remotely socialist and been very much more, you know, kind of corporate, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, whether you're talking about Woodrow Wilson or, you know, FDR to a lesser extent, but, uh, you know, everybody's pretty much everybody else has been very, you know, corporate, you know, supporting the, you know, the big, the big corporations over the, over the, you know, over the people, basically. What, what, what does it mean in your context, having grown up in the Northeast of England and seeing, you know, seeing the, you know, uh, you know, what, what does it mean to you, socialism? For me, it, it meant solidarity, um, wanting to help each other, uh, support each other. You know, I've been a trade unionist all my life. The whole concept of unity and strength, um, also a sort of us and them camaraderie. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, people have called called me radical in the past, and I have said, yes, well, I'll tell you who radicalized me. It was Margaret Thatcher. Yeah. She yeah. radicalized an entire generation, you know, by destroying the heavy industries I've just been talking about, the yeah. steelworks, the coal mining areas. Um, and, and, you know, I've, I've seen seen communities collapse um, because of, of this uh, 
this um, tyranny against and persecution against the working classes, mm -hmm. uh, which is why I'm I am surprised in in some ways that uh, they've turned and started voting Tory. But mm -hmm. uh, as I say, I can also understand it because Labour in um, in England now is becoming increasingly a spent force. Yeah. Yeah, it's finished and, uh, in Scotland, I would say. But uh, yeah, well, wh where did that where did that start? I mean, I mean, you could easily point to Tony Blair, and because uh, mm. uh, you, because it was he took over Labour after John Smith passed away, and I, yeah. I think John Smith was a, a, from what I understand, was a pretty, you know, a pretty solid socialist, if I if I understand correctly. Yeah. And, I think he was then, the best prime minister we never had. Um, right. it, it it didn't actually start with Tony Blair. It started before then. It started with, we don't have to worry about Newcastle, Gateshead, Durham, Blythe, Biker, you know, they're yeah. always going to vote Labour. So, you know, we, we can forget about them. And yeah, take them, for, take them for granted, of course. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And this is something that the SNP needs to remember. Yeah. Um, that you cannot take the electorate for granted because sooner or later they will turn and uh, and they did right across the north of England and started voting Tory and it, it was a horrific thing um, to see but mm -hmm. uh, but that's that's what they did they started voting in the Eton mob as I call them who have absolutely nothing whatsoever in common uh, with the working classes. But, well, and uh, and sheer dis disdain for it, I mean, uh, you know, for the mm. working class. One thing that struck me, I mean, uh, you know, coming from the United States, of course, you have this big, you know, kind of gap between rich and poor. And, and you know, and we do certainly have a class system that is very different from in, you know, from in particularly England, but the UK more mm -hmm. broadly. And, you know, you, you have, you know, you know, you have rich people that, but, you know, I mean, but they want to, you know, they also, they, they often, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, talk about their humble origins. And I come from that. I'm like you, you know, I, I had to work for a living and work my way up. Whereas here it's more kind of this old, you know, aristocratic, um, you know, really deeply embedded in the in, in the UK system, you know, this class thing of deference of tugging your forelock and, you know, mm -hmm. this type of thing, you know, uh, reverence for people like Jacob Rees-Mogg, even though this idea that anybody is better than anybody else is just so patently absurd to me. Um, how do you how do you see that? I mean, I, again, I mean, the, the fact that the UK, you know, they have a monarch, they have they still have dukes and earls and all this bizarre you know, aspects of the social hierarchy and, uh, you know, and people still like respect it or give them reverence for whatever reason. And how do you see that and how it's affected, you know, the way that British politics uh, is conducted? Mm -hmm. It's toxic, absolutely toxic. I mean, yeah. there's been nearly a hundred or so um, peers created uh, in uh, in the the Johnson Cameron years, mm -hmm. and you know that they these are mates of theirs who haven't earned their way into the House of Lords. They've bought their way in, and it, it's um, it's appalling. Um, you know, the House of Lords is a draconian institution that has no place in the twenty first century. In fact, there's so much wrong. In the Westminster Westminster bubble, um, it's a no-brainer for people in Scotland just to cut the ties free and and just get the hell out. Yeah. And you know that's why eventually I headed um, north to Scotland because okay. um, I'd been. At, at, with the Labour Party since a teenager, and then Tony Blair turned round and, and uh, lied about WMD, the war in Iraq. So when the war in Iraq started, I tore up my Labour Party card and I was left homeless. Yeah. And 
there was a great politician, which many of your listeners will know, you've probably heard of him as well, called Tony Benn. Yes. And I would see him regularly. Who, 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 I, I know, I know Hillary Benn, his son was in the shadow cabinet under Corbyn, but tell, but I don't know a lot about uh, uh, Tony Benn. So can you tell me a little well, bit about him? Tony Benn um, was was a, a great socialist, a lifelong socialist, and he was much loved by the working classes. Uh, funnily enough, he started off as a lord, uh, Lord Anthony Wedgwood Benn, and he uh, got rid of his uh, his title. And he really, when you were talking to him, you did really feel as though um he is one of us he feels the pain he feels yeah. the hardship and he he was a great political mentor for me and i said to him i really oh, sorry, so you, you, struggling you, you, you knew him personally yes yes oh, okay. and i t i said to him i'm really struggling staying in the labor party and he said Yvonne, there are far too many good socialists out there who are now homeless and they've got nowhere to go and you're better off staying in you know blair won't be around forever this period will not last forever but the the war was definitely a straw breaker for me uh -huh. and uh so i i left and, and and was homeless and went to work overseas in uh, qatar Mm -hmm. And while I was there, I started to hear rumours of, of this party being developed called the Respect Party. Mm -hmm. And it was a group of really... Was that, 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 that's with that George, George Galloway, is that right? Yes, but at that was, time, was he, was he it the, wasn't... Was he, the, was he the founder of it? or He um... was one of the founders. The other was uh, George Monbiot, the great environmentalist. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ken yeah. Loach the great film okay. director yeah. um, and, and uh, you know, quite a, a number of other really great inspirational people uh, came together and formed the Respect Party. And it, it, was, um, it was wonderful, you know, we had a home again and we fielded candidates and, and uh, in councils and, and uh, got quite a few seats but um unfortunately uh there were fissures and internal power struggles and it imploded yeah. and around about that time i moved to scotland and you know, said that um, I was going to campaign for independence. Okay. I had said earlier, you know, why don't we um, open a branch of respect in Scotland? And George Galloway said, oh, well, they've got the SNP there. So, you know, um, the Scottish people don't need us. Of course, he's done a, a complete about turn. Okay. Um, uh, okay. Very quickly, I, I, I do, I do want to I, I do want to move to the S, move on to the SNP in just a sec. Mm -hmm. But I just want to, before we leave your your Labour Party experience um, and uh, and and in in my perception, uh, I mean the uh, Bill Clinton in the United States and uh, Tony Blair in the UK were kind of peas in the same pod to a large extent. Yeah. But it was the war? I mean, you know, that certainly that was a big. Uh, uh, you know, a factor. But for me, you know, in terms of Clinton and the way I perceive Blair, uh, they very much, uh, you know, basically abandoned the working class and and, and sought corporate support, you know, and, and for their campaigns and for their, uh, you know, and, and were very, you know, neoliberal economics. They espoused very strongly and, um, you know, and basically didn't really, you know, bother trying to get you know, support of the working class through adopting policies that would actually help them. Is that your perception of, of British labor as well? Well, it was a very heady, intoxicating time. And I remember when Bill Clinton came over, you know, uh, him and Blair, they were like the dream team, you know, the yeah. things are going to get better. Uh, this is, you know, the can-do era and, and 
people had high aspirations and ambitions and the future looked great. And then things started to happen. We suddenly started to have to pay for university. Yeah. Um, there was a dreadful scheme uh, called ATOS, uh, which came that's a, in that's under a Blair. French, that's a French company, right? That, that does the, the, uh, the, the, uh, they're kind of a subcontractor for social policy. Is that? Yes. Is that, that, yeah. And, and um, you know, if you mention ATOS to to the um, unemployed, the little spit on the ground, it was dreadful, but that was a Blairite idea. Um, private funding in the hospitals, again, another Blairite idea. Yeah, uh, I, and I, I, suddenly... I privatization of prisons and the, the, uh, the, mm -hmm. the criminal justice system. I don't know to what extent that was under uh -huh. Blair, but that was certainly, you know, that, that but, certainly... Yeah, the socialist dream started to look a little bit jaded. And then, of course, um, there was Iraq. And that, that was the, um, the finish for me. Okay. So, as I say, I left Labour, was homeless for a while, um, then joined Respect. And but politically, not literally homeless. Yeah, just politically. Yeah. Oh, okay, all right, so, yeah. And and then um, and then I sold my home and up sticks and and came to Scotland. Mm -hmm. When in 2011 I heard about the Scots are going for independence and we think they'll get it and I thought, wow, okay. you know. Well, and, and why, why 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 did that intrigue you? I mean, I I, I felt the same way. I mean, I, I live in France. I have a you know a, a government po you know I'm a I'm a teacher in the university here, so mm -hmm. you know I have no financial interest in it in in it. But it's always been it's just. Uh, but my father was Scottish, and then when I heard in 2011, oh Alex Salmond, they won the election. They're going to be going for independence. Like you know, of course, you know it's a it was such a no brainer for me from the beginning, and I began to think, oh well, you know they could use a good written constitution, mm -hmm. blah blah blah. And I visited Scotland, you know, many many times since then, up until the the the, the later, you know, up until the the last real SNP conference. And uh, I, I just couldn't believe that there were people who were against it. They just didn't understand. And so, mm. uh, so, but that's why I got intrigued. It's just like, of course, I mean, why wouldn't you want to become independent? I mean, it, it, it's just such a no brainer, but how did you perceive it? And, and what, you know, what was it about the prospect of Scottish independence that, you know, uh, you know, made you up stakes and come move to Scotland and become involved? It was getting away from Westminster. I had uh, lived in London for about 15 years and mm -hmm. saw up close and personal, you know. Yeah, but so how, just very quickly, you, li you lived in London at the time and then you came to... Yeah. Um, so you didn't live in the north of England at that time? No, you, no, I moved down to Fleet Street and, and was working um, as a journalist in London. Mm -hmm. And I saw up close on almost a daily basis the shenanigans that went on in Westminster the sleaze the corruption um, which actually just looks like a kindergarten party now compared to <laughs> that's bad <laughs> you know it, it, yeah. sorry it was it, it was mild then but it was yeah. bad enough then to make me want to leave to what it is now now it's it's just the sleaze, um, the stench of corruption, it's overwhelming now. You know, I can smell it from my home in the Scottish borders. <laughs> so I moved up to Scotland. Um, I Unfortunately, I, um, I couldn't find any uh, generation, um, you know, father, grandfather, great-grandfather, any Scots in my um in the family tree and i did look hard although my <laughs> dna says that i'm 53 percent uh celtic so that's okay. good enough for I mean, me you're in there somewhere you're in there somewhere you know if it's, yeah maybe it's uh -huh. ireland maybe it's Brittany, where i live uh, -huh. uh you know uh -huh. it doesn't matter you know, but i i remember saying to somebody oh gosh you know what do you have to do to be scottish and she said you just move here 
and be one of us. And I went, oh, right, well, that's easy. So, <laughs> you know, I'm uh, absolutely delighted to be um, adopted and, and living in Scotland. And respect was uh, in a in its final death throes. And so I um, started to work towards independence. I shared platforms, um, building up to the referendum um, with the first minister, with uh, his deputy, uh, Nicola Sturgeon. And I really worked hard for independence. And, and I also then um, joined the SNP Okay, so, um, just, just, so just to get this clear, 2011, you hear that there's going to, as I did, you hear that, you know, the, 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 the SNP won the over outright majority in the elections mm -hmm. of 2011. They, uh, they said, okay, on the basis of holding a referendum, you said, uh, yeah, uh, mm -hmm. I, I want to get away from there. So you, you move up to Scotland and you begin to work directly with Alex Salmond or, you know. Uh, well, not directly. Um, you know, he, he probably doesn't even remember, but we shared platforms um, because the other thing, um, by that time, uh, my profile was quite high in the Muslim community because I had converted to Islam. Okay. So I was able to uh, go and reach out uh, to the Muslim community in Glasgow, Stirling, Dundee, okay. uh, Edinburgh, and, and talk to them about independence. Okay. And and just, just tell me a little bit about your conversion to Islam. Did you were you raised uh, were you raised religiously or just uh, br briefly? I, I don't want to get too sidetracked. Uh, no, but I, no. find it, I find it fascinating. Um, uh -huh. um, I was a, a Protestant, um, a, a member of the Church of England. I probably went to church maybe twice a month, which. You know, today is bordering not, not on bad. fanaticism. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, after the Taliban experience, um, I did give them an undertaking. I said, if you let me go, I promise I'll read your holy book. And uh, when they released me, I mean, they held on to other Westerners, but they let me go. And I started reading the Quran. I fulfilled the promise. And, uh, but also as a journalist covering the Middle East and Asia, I realized just by watching the Taliban that uh, Islam was more of a way of life than uh, just a religion that was picked no, up no, I, down I understand on a Friday. That. It, it's it's fascinating because I know that Judaism it's very much about rituals you know and yes and, you know, it's not so much a belief in God uh -huh. the way that you, you for, for example Protestant Christianity is especially that I uh -huh. experienced growing up in Texas with Baptists and all that but uh, uh -huh. uh, but yeah it's 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 really it's really interesting anyway I I, I we'll have to save that for another time because I, I yes I, I'm absolutely uh -huh. fascinated but I'll, I'll be but, delighted to have you back and just talk about religion but I you know in the remaining time I'd like to get uh -huh. more about your own political spiritual yeah. journey so 2011 mm -hmm. uh you know referendum you say duh you go to you move to Scotland and no uh, brainer mm -hmm. yeah exactly same with me you know I mean in, in my own way so uh and so and so you 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 joined the SNP or you know what, what, uh, what eventually yes I I joined the SNP um because I was going to join straight away but um after talking to some of the senior officials we just decided it would be better if I was on the outside um and and not you know uh i would have more credibility talking about independence as an as an independent voice yeah. so um but when the referendum was lost i joined the snp okay. and continued um it i mean that referendum was quite amazing because it was, you know, it, when it, was you a, it was it was spectacular, really. I mean, I, yeah. I visited numerous times during the campaign, and 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 I've many many times since then. But I mean, I remember going to a you know a, a, a rally at a church with Jim Sillers talking. I mean, wow, what an orator Jim Sillers is! I mean, he's mm -hmm. just fantastic. And there uh, was so much energy and so much. Oh, and then uh, and, and it, it, 
And I remember I, you know, I was there during the count and I was, you know, work, I was working with Independence Live. And I remember going down to the Emirates Arena for the, for the, for the, you know, um, for the count. And I went by George Square and there, there were flags waving. I mean, just the most uh -huh. beautiful joy. I remember that this, this lovely woman painted a, a, a saltire on my cheek. Uh, before I went down there, I was wearing a kilt. I got down to the Emirates Arena, and and uh, Kevin and I, uh, you know, uh, we we did we we did the first, you know, po a political podcast from that, and it actually got we actually signed papers to sign it over to the li the Library of Scotland as as like historical. Mm -hmm footage and i mean it was, it was it was just fantastic and then i remember you know after the result i mean i stayed up all night and and it was weird because i got a an infection in my left elbow it was bizarre uh but i i was uh, but anyway i was going back i took a taxi back with some from with some you folks must have brushed there. against a tory <laughs> must have been must have been but i remember getting going to um i i got off at um i i, I got off at George, the taxi from george square and this guy comes up to me who was a a, a bus driver a, a tour bus driver and he said what happened and he said vote no they it was vote no and and he said oh i've got a and now i've got to take a bunch of japanese tourists around and tell them what a great country we have you know, and I actually met him later, you know, a couple of years later, I, I remember we, we recounted that experience, but it was so vivid in my mind. But, uh, oh, it was just devastating, you know, and um, mm -hmm. but uh, well, it it it, it was a, a bizarre night. I found the most shocking, revolting thing that happened that uh, that night was seeing uh, Labour no voters hugging and kissing and dancing with Tory no yeah. voters, yeah. and I just it it was an awful sight, and I think it's one which many people won't forget, won't forgive. But having said that, you know we came from a point of zero and got to forty five. Yeah, um, it it had been higher, and you know. Alex Salmond had said, um, I think it was three or four days beforehand, the polls were coming up like this. And I said, you know, we're, we're going to overtake. And he said, not too soon. We don't want to peak too soon. Yeah. And I just thought, well, it doesn't matter because once we start, you know, it's going to continue. But of course, when... Uh, the polls showed that uh, the yes voters were going to win. That's when the vow happened. Yeah. And uh, and again, you know, trading on people's fear and greed and terrifying the mm. oldies that they were going to lose their pensions, and it did the trick. They'll never be able to do it again. I think... Uh, any attempted lies project fear will be spotted straight away. And so I, I don't think it can happen again. Okay. But we've prevaricated and obfuscated for so long now um, that uh, that that just, I was tearing my hair out with frustration because um, it was like Alex Salmond had said, the SNP were galvanizing people bringing back the spirit of 2014 and marching you know us all up the hill and then marching us back down again and marching us back up and yeah. uh yeah. and it it was like a rerun of the, of the grand old duke of york and mm. in the end i uh, left the yeah. snp Sorry, would would you explain that, please? Uh, the, the the Duke the Duke of York reference and marching up and down. I mean, I, I understand oh, right. historically, but I, I, historically, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm less well. There's a there's a nursery rhyme. Um, the grand old Duke of York. He had ten thousand men. He marched them up to the top of the hill, and he marched them down again. And when they were up, they were up. And when they were down, they were down. And when they were ha um, halfway up, they were neither up or down. And then it, okay. the, it goes on. And basically, this is... So it's, like, it's, like a, it's like a nursery rhyme, basically. Yes. Okay. And okay. this is... Right. It, I didn't it's that. a great analogy for what the SNP leadership have done. Mm -hmm. And at the launch of the Alipa conference, 
we saw all the front pages of the national uh, newspaper. Um, Indy Ref 2 is on its way. It's here. It's going it, to happen. It, it, it's, uh, it's sad. It's, you know, I mean, I, you know, I, I, you know, I think the national is a good paper and I know they have a lot of good people in it, but they've been, they've been dragging it out. I mean, it, it, it's kind of sad because you have, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if you have, you could look at, you know, th things on the sun or the daily express of, you know, all these, you know, repeated headlines over, you know, immigrants, you know, or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. But the problem is the same as the national for promising an, a referendum, you know, right around the corner and it's nowhere to be seen, you know. I mean, well, when you put all those front pages together, which is what they did, at the Alipa mm. conference, it was there. You know, you even the most uh, ardent supporter of the SNP would look and cringe because yeah. we have been led up the hill and back down and up and down for uh, at least two or three times a year mm. uh, since 2014. And the thing is, um, Nicola and, and her cabinet... Uh, have talked the talk, and then it's dropped, and and yeah. they haven't walked the walk. Yeah. Um, you know, walk the line, Nicola. We want to see you walk the line. That's the big yeah. saying these days. Yeah. And, and, and um, the whole and the uh, whole thing of you know, I mean, you know, Alex Salmond and the fact that you know the the basically the plot against him. You know, I don't know how much how many millions or hundreds of thousands of millions of pounds went into that. Apparently, you know, from what Craig Murray has disclosed, and therefore he was jailed. Uh, you know, they interviewed like some 700 people or something like that. The police did trying to get any dirt whatsoever on Alex Salmon. Mm -hmm. It goes to trial. He's he's accused of rape. He's and he could have been he could be in jail for he could have been in jail for life, but it turned out that they were all just fabricated lies. And uh, and you know, and the jury saw that, and they just and they, they you know they they dropped it, and you know they 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 dismissed all of them, uh, all of the charges against him, and then and and because Craig Murray had been you know reporting the uh, you know basically the the conduct of the uh, of the prosecution and the fact that the, you know the, he was talking about how he would be he, how he was with the many other members of the press in the court chambers. And as soon as, you know, they would report everything that the prosecution did. But when the defense came up, they just, you know, the the the, the press just dropped their pens and didn't even report on it whatsoever. And so you never got that that different side of it. And uh, and then, you know, and Craig was put in jail for several months and he's out now, which luckily and he's still mm -hmm. his good self. But, oh, my God, you know, what's become of the Scottish judiciary when you're putting away, you know, really decent honorable people like craig murray for these types of things i mean how do you see that in terms of the craig murray situation um well i was reading the the media uh, the mainstream media and the narrative that i was reading was completely different to what i had been told prior to the case mm -hmm. and so I, I i just thought you know this is an open shut case he he's gonna go down and then um i read uh two stories from craig murray um he, he won't mind me saying this he's no journalist uh, no no yeah, um, yeah, i'm sure no, and yeah. the stories were absolutely tedious in the minutiae of detail and I waded through all the evidence you know he missed nothing out even the, the most boring details which uh, would have been subbed out of anybody else's article and I just thought my god if uh, if if this is true um there's no way that Alex Salmon can be convicted you know and i i'm just reading all the the stuff that uh presumably the jury heard yeah. and i could see that the, there isn't any way that uh he is going to be convicted and so i was ringing around a few colleagues saying did you know this did you know that and 
And why isn't the, the media reporting both sides? And so, you know, if there was a conspiracy, the media were part of it. Well, absolutely. I, no, no, I, no, question. no question. Yeah. No question. I prefer to go more for cock up than conspiracy, but then I mm. read. Uh, no, no, Craig, it's, it's, it's too deliberate in my view. I mean, yeah, well, I then read Craig Murray's stuff when he came out of prison, and I just thought there's no way he would be so silly as to go to write an article that would send him straight back into prison and you know i i read what he'd uh, said and and then i spoke to other people and it, it was just my god this this is a conspiracy what i want to read what i can't wait to read is alex salmon's book Mm -hmm. Because there is a book, there is a film, there is uh, a radio play, there is drama. Um, you know, who who needs to uh, uh, watch Game of Thrones? My goodness, the shenanigans that went on in Hollywood have been absolutely despicable. Mm -hmm. And I am just amazed that uh, Alex Salmond has emerged um, as strong as he has. Mm -hmm. And, uh, with, with his, you know, with a his less dignity. person would have crumbled. Yeah, with his dignity intact, in my view. You know, yes, and, uh, yeah. yes. And uh, I, I think that um, the truth will come out. It always does. Now, whether we have to wait 5, 10, 20 years, the truth will come out mm -hmm. and there will be a lot of people hanging their heads in shame when that mm -hmm. does happen okay I, I wanted to get on to a I, 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 we see these questions popping up and I you know I, I don't always have time to you know absorb them and, and and ask them but one of the one of the recent questions I just saw pop up had to do with well you know Nicola Sturgeon has said that it would happen by the referendum would happen by 2023. In, in, and in all, we have a, I've formed a group called the SSRG, the Scottish Sovereignty Research Group, and we've submitted proposals to the, uh, basically saying to the pro indie parties in both Westminster and Holyrood, you don't need a referendum. Just, you know, the, the Scottish uh, MPs withdraw from the Treaty of Union, the uh, SNP or the, you know, the MSPs uh, declare that they are the, the, the sole parliament which represents the sovereignty of the Scottish people. And that's it. I mean, or at least give it a shot, you know, and we've submitted it, we've sent it, we've heard nothing back. Uh, and, and we've even got, we, we even, you know, contacted the EFTA, the European Free Trade Association. And, um, uh, and they would love to have Scotland, you know, in, in EFTA, but, you know, the Scottish government has, to, and, and they're kind of indifferent about how that comes about in in that in the, they need you know the Scottish government needs to have the power to you know the the competence to sign international treaties and the powers to abide by them but I'm just kind of mystified that there hasn't been you know more of a you know a response saying you know you could be in the single market now if you would if you would embrace this strategy uh, before so I mean I, I just, so how do you see the SNP right now? And it, you know, from I've talked to Craig Murray, and you know, I've, I've and I, you know, I've interviewed him a couple of times, and I've also uh, you know read his columns, and he, you know, he's of the view, and especially in his most recent column, that the, the SNP has basically come become comfortable as the colonial administrators, basically of of the British state. Uh, do you see it that way? Well, it, it is uh, looking more and more like that, but I also appreciate that um, they, they can't just walk away. What they could do, though, is get heavily involved in uh, the All Under One Banner movement mm -hmm. because I think people power will, um, will bring about a referendum just as quickly as any begging bowl to Downing Street will. And, uh, you know, th there, there are different ways that we can get a referendum. 
Um, just walking away, I think, is incredibly naive because uh, I think Boris Johnson would love nothing more. Um, they would just cut off funding. They would freeze the banks. We've seen what they've, uh, what the Americans have done to Afghanistan. You know, there is no money. There mm. is no money. And if um, if they just suddenly cut off um, funding, wages, pensions, uh, froze assets, froze bank accounts. Uh, it's the sort of things that the Tories would do. Don't forget, uh, Britain has still got billions and billions of dollars worth of assets and money belonging to the Iranians that they should have handed back years mm. ago. That's why that poor woman, uh, Nazarene Zagara Ratcliffe, has, has been... Uh, locked up in Tehran. You know, mm -hmm. she's a political pawn in a, in a game. So, so I can so, 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 play so, the I, devil's advocate. If we just sure, walk I mean, away, um, they will come for us and they'll come for us in a way that they know is most effective. And that is well, they have, financially. They have, long, they have long experience in that, you know, given their colonial barbarity yeah. and uh and you know and i guess there's no reason to, to to doubt that they would be as as brutal with scotland as they were with india and the partition mm -hmm. ireland and the partition uh many other uh examples as well but uh, uh i'd like to get a, to a couple questions uh first of all uh your new book the caledonians could you tell us a little bit about that Oh, right. Well, this is, uh, I happen to have a co <laughs> cover here. Uh, the central character is uh, a, a Scottish history master called Mr. Petrie, and he is a time traveler, and he can uh, go back in time and change um, history. He can't he can't make big changes, though. He can just tweak history here and there. Um, and he's also a great supporter for independence. Um, so I think any independence-minded person will enjoy reading it. He um, he also has, has given me a, a lot of ideas about the Scottish education system because I've done a lot of research into Scottish history um, to write the book. And when I've spoken to, uh, especially in the borders, to people here and said, did you know this? Did you know that? And they said, no. And I'm saying, well, surely Scottish history is taught in schools. And of course, it's not. Yes. yes. And I think that Scottish history in, um, well, it'd be great to happen now, but in an independent Scotland, sh certainly Scottish history should be taught as, as one of the compulsory subjects in the school curriculum, from the very little ones to, uh, to the seniors, because it's so important, because I have been brainwashed, um, Oh, I mean, um, me, me as an American, completely. I mean, you know, oh, you know, oh yeah, all uh -huh. these great you know, founding fathers. Oh, wait, they had slaves, and you know, they they were, mm -hmm. like, let, you know, uh, slave holding slave holding landowners. Uh, you know, the, the the genocide of the Indians. I mean, it it just goes on and on. But we're just you know taught this you know fairy tale glorified history of the United States that just and you know mm -hmm. I teach I teach U.S. history and I'm I'm reading you know. You know, I'm, I'm reading more than ever about it. And it's like, oh man, it was that was a brutal history, and it came and and we learned from the masters, the UK. Mm -hmm. You know, they were the best. You know, in terms mm -hmm. of just absolutely savage colonialism, massacres, genocide, they were the best. You know, I mean, they did it everywhere. You know, whether it was in Australia, New Zealand, India, um, you know, they were just genocidal, fanatical imperialists. And, uh, you know, we in America learn from them and we put it on steroids, you know. And so it's it's hard, you know, when you say stuff like, oh, well, the cut off the bank accounts, all that. That may be true, but it's it. But it's it's like, you know, Scotland submitting to blackmail, say, well, you will do this. We'll, we'll cut you off if you if you do this, if you become independent. And I don't know. It's 
it, it's it's tough because I, I think that there is ab absolutely ample justification under international law for Scotland to simply say, you know, the Scottish MPs to simply say, we're done with the Treaty of Union, we're out of here, we're independent. They can do that. Uh, but whether they will or not is a, is obviously an open question. Well, I think that uh, the SNP could have used their legal um, heavyweights in a much more productive manner in the sure. last, well, since 2014, to find another way out. And I am certain that there would have been another way out over Europe because Scotland was, you know, quite adamant, we do not want to leave Europe. And that could have been a very lengthy court case in, in which time we could have built up the, um, the desire, you know, and, and, and the move to, uh, to become independent. But unfortunately, I think uh, that Craig Murray is right, that they yeah. have become too comfortable, too cosy. Uh, and, and, you know, you look at the abuse, the daily abuse that the oh, MPs no, yeah. representing Scotland receive in the House of Commons. Sure, sure. I would Black, bring them out. Ian Blackford jeered. I mean, it, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, it, no, it's really, disgusting. you know, the ugly face of racism is so evident. Yeah. And that would be um, enough for me to say I'm not having my people abused, cursed, you know. Uh, open to this racism and uh, I'm taking them out and uh, I would order them out. Uh, Sinn Féin MPs can operate perfectly well and represent their constituents um, without having to sit in Parliament. Yeah. And there's I think ten, that there's only 10 of them. So, I mean, they're not going to sway any vote anyway and they're saying i'm not taking i'm not pledging allegiance to any queen or any monarch uh -huh. which i think is mm -hmm. completely honorable you know i mean yeah. I wouldn't, you know i mean uh screw that <laughs> oh uh -huh. yeah you were appointed by god i, I gotta respect you i mean it's, it's just ludicrous mm -hmm. you know and the way that you know the i mean the british government is still based on divine right you still have i mean it's it's just insane and and the the idea that the Scottish, you know, MPs just say, let's let's get out of here and find a way to get out. But as you mm -hmm. say, I think too, too many of them are too comfortable and they just don't want to, you know, they don't want to get off the gravy train. And, you know, that's my reading of it. You know, maybe I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I know I know that there are MPs which are much more sympathetic to that. But uh, anyway, mm -hmm. uh, we need to wrap it up. But uh, I've totally enjoyed having you. And uh, is there anything you'd like to say before we sign off? No, just don't underestimate people power. We can't rely on the people in power. So let's rely on people power to deliver independence. Because once people start to move, once the masses start to move, that's when the leaders will sit up and take, take notice. And, uh, and if they don't, uh, they will become irrelevant so you know at the the next um all under one banner march or the next independence march we should uh forget about whether people are alipa or snp you know whoever mm -hmm. and just get together and march for independence it's the only way we're going to get it boots on the ground Right on. Very inspiring. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Yvonne, for being with us. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you. And again, uh, stay on for a couple of minutes after we say goodbye to yeah. our, our, our viewers. But uh, again, it's been really inspiring talking to you. And thank you very much for being with us this evening. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. My pleasure.